Hello and welcome to Salute Your Sports. We had a bye week last week, but don't worry, Tom and I are back just in time for a jam-packed show. We'll be talking all sorts of sports, the biggest of which is the NBA Conference Finals. We got Mavericks Warriors, we have Heat Celtics. Who's going to win those series? What are the keys? We will break it down. It's going to be a great show. Betting locks of the week towards the end, sports trivia, so much stuff to look forward to, Tom. And of course, uh, Kentucky Derby. Um, we can touch on that briefly as we also preview uh, the Preakness Stakes a little bit, picking our favorite horses in that race. Of course, NHL with a whopping five game sevens out of eight series. Absolutely fantastic uh, excitement on that. And of course, we'll touch a little bit of baseball as well as the Yankees in particular are slugging their way to an incredible start to the season. And we're going to see, you know, are they going to stick around? Are they going to fade? But of course, Common, as you mentioned, we are going to the NBA playoffs, just like everybody had it drawn up in the Western Conference, the Golden State Warriors and the Dallas Mavericks. Interesting series, uh, just to kind of recap a little bit, um, Warriors dispatching of the Grizzlies in six. Uh, John Morant missing the past couple of games in that one. Uh, a number of injuries, a pretty contentious series back and forth in terms of were there intents to injure, weren't there, that sort of uh, thing where it's really kind of tough to, to legislate, you know, at the rate that these guys are moving. It's just an incredible, you know, athletic feat that they're doing. And sometimes awful things happen. And it's really unfortunate, especially when a star like John Morant uh, goes down in the series. On the other side, Mavericks winning in seven after I believe we had this conversation. The Suns were up to nothing. And I said, Phoenix is too long, too athletic. And they can punish in the post with De uh, DeAndre Ayton. Mavericks actually go out and absolutely embarrass Phoenix in Game 7. Wild. Wasn't close at any point. I mean, maybe at tip it was close. Uh, but <laughs> after that point, Dallas pretty much ran away with it. So looking ahead now that we've got that recap out of the way, um, you know, what are the keys? Let's start with the top-seeded team, uh, the Golden State Warriors. You know, something we didn't think we'd be saying is the three-seed in the West this year. Uh, what are some keys to the series for Golden State? Yeah, real quickly, first, uh, kind of hit on the points you talked about. Uh, first and foremost, I'll keep this simple and brief. No Ill, Ill intention from Jordan Poole. So forget about that. If you think he was trying to hurt, hurt John Morant, you're just plain wrong. Uh, secondly, wild. Uh, I'll have more on this maybe in statement of the week, but uh, that blowout game seven by the Mavericks, not shocking they won. But to be up 30 at the half, the only thing that was close was Luka versus Phoenix, 27 points each at halftime. They asked him, did you know? He said, he said of course, of course. Uh, so speaks to uh, Luka's abilities. Uh, as for the keys for the Warriors, uh, there is one overarching key is shooting. I know that sounds weird. I know that sounds simple. Uh, but the Warriors can be lights out like they were against the Nuggets. Uh, but, you know, live by the three, die by the three. Quite frankly, they didn't shoot the ball well against the Grizzlies. 34% from three uh, in that series. And the biggest key is Steph Curry. Are we going to see MVP level Steph Curry? Because if we do, they're definitely winning the championship. Or are we going to see a Steph Curry that's been up and down? It's kind of weird to say, but Steph Curry uh, has not been lights out uh, shooting the basketball this season. And in particular, that last series. He did average 26 points per game against the Grizzlies. But what happened? He shot 41% from the field and 33% from threes. That is not going to cut it against the Mavericks. Curry's got to step up. He's got to play like the MVP player that he can be. So for me, it's very simple. Are we going to see an MVP level Steph Curry? Or are we going to see a guy who, you know, is putting up points simply because of volume? Uh, so... If the Warriors' biggest star plays like how we can, uh, they'll be fine. So a lot of eyes on him. I think it's huge. He hasn't won that NBA Finals MVP. Uh, this is his time to carry his team in the Western Conference Finals and in the NBA Finals. Absolutely. Uh, in terms of my keys for this series, you know, obviously shooting's a pretty significant one, but really it's going to be um, – how, basically, how do you punish Dallas for not having a great inside presence? This is something that Phoenix did not do especially well with DeAndre Ayton, 
Um, well, Golden State actually catches a little bit of a break because Dallas doesn't have a particularly strong post presence either. Um, so that's kind of the way to try to beat the Mavericks is going into the post. And that's not really Golden State's game. But I guess in terms of like, you know, who's going to, you know, step up and make plays down low. I mean, does Draymond Green have a little bit more presence? Kevon Looney, somebody like that. Um, just for a couple of minutes, just doing a little bit of work on the inside to open up some in and out game. I think that's going to be key. And then probably the biggest thing. And this is going to kind of dovetail into keys for the Mavericks, but who's going to guard Luka? Gary Payton II was uh, Golden State's primary perimeter defender and really, really good at it. Without him, I mean, who's who's going to guard Luka? And of course, Draymond. Not, not stop him. Draymond could be one. I think on the perimeter, though, might end up being like Andrew Wiggins, you know, Clay Thompson. Is he up for that? I think it's going to be a team effort. But without that kind of like blue defensive guy to just try to like get in Luca's way, make him work uh, without necessarily burning up your energy so that, you know, guys like Steph and Clay, you know, Jordan Poole, like they can go to work on the offensive end. It's going to have to be a collective effort where I think a lot of guys are going to be switching on to Luca throughout this series. And it's just who's going to be able to bother him the most. I think Andrew Wiggins is going to draw that assignment primarily. Um, but yeah, Draymond, of course, is going to have a significant role as well. Kind of interesting, like a small five guarding a big one, almost. It's a really, really interesting dynamic if you think about it in terms of like traditional basketball positioning, which, of course, um, both of these teams are eschewing. So I think that um, that's probably the biggest key is, you know, what can Golden State do in the post to try to gain a slight advantage there? And then who's going to guard Luka? Uh, at least nominally guard. Sure. I know that Luke is going to definitely go off and hit his PRA like he always does. Yeah, I mean, kind of going off that, I sort of agree with you, but I, in a way, I sort of don't, just because uh, I actually think this is a good matchup for the Warriors, by the way, because oh, for sure. uh, I think they don't have anyone that could punish their size. And actually, the Warriors are probably at home. They may not say this. They may not be looking ahead. But I'm sure they're glad that Giannis is out because Giannis would would punish them, I think. Uh, so I think they're a small ball team. They've got that death lineup with Poole, Thompson, Curry, and Wiggins. And there's no great big guys left. Embiid is gone. Giannis is gone. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think they, uh, they're smiling. So I don't even think they really have to punish the Mavericks, uh, you know, in the paint just because I think they can uh, outplay them on the perimeter. Uh, and to your point, like, obviously, like, you know, you want to, who's going to guard Luca? That's obvious. That's a, that's a, a big key, but I'd, I'd go the other way. I'd go that uh, the key, this is sort of the Mavericks key and obviously the Warriors key uh, in reverse and stopping them. Because for me, Luca is Luca. He is magic. Mm -hmm. Yes. You're going to try to contain him. Could you do it? Maybe realistically you, you can't. And Luca put up numbers the whole series against the Suns. Luca and Michael Jordan go back and forth for career playoff points per game. I know Luca has a smaller sample size. I think he was just ahead of Jordan, then maybe he dipped just under, but it's like him and MJ are neck and neck for most playoff points per game. Uh, Luca was scoring more than 40 points uh, in some games they lost in the playoffs. Uh, so I actually think the Warriors' biggest key. Uh, is stopping the other guys, and that's in reverse. The Mavericks' biggest key, who's going to step up and help Luka? Uh, because uh, they definitely did not do that early in the series, lost the first two games against the Suns. You look at game three, Tom, which they won, Jalen Brunson had 28 points. You look at game four, which the Mavs also won, Dorian Finney-Smith, eight three-pointers and 24 points. Uh, game six, a, one, a game they won, 19 points for Reggie Bullock, 18 for Brunson, 15 for Dinwiddie off the bench. And then game seven, Dinwiddie had 30 points, Brunson had 24. Uh, so Luka's going to be Luka. Uh, the biggest key is, are those Mavericks players going to step up and help him? And I know, I know you talk a lot about, like, regression and mean, and it's really hard to kind of put into – perspective because if you look at Dallas the second half of the season uh, Boston had the best record Dallas had the second best record in the second half of the season so maybe we shouldn't be surprised because they did have the best record in the West Grizzlies were up there too but I think the Mavs 
since the All-Star break, I think the status had the best record in the Western Conference. Uh, so were these guys the second half of the year and the way they played against the Jazz, the way they played against the Suns, is that how they're going to play the rest of their career? Or are they just on a hot streak? Uh, because if Brunson plays the way he played uh, in that last series, if Dinwiddie plays like he did in Game 7, the Mavericks are going to win the series. On paper, the Warriors have four of the five best players in the series. Mm-hmm. Curry, Clay, Jordan Poole, Draymond, if they play at the level we've seen them play this year, and for Clay, Draymond, and Steph their whole career. Uh, but if Brunson and Dinwiddie and Bullock and Finney Smith are going to play the way they played the last series, I don't know who has the four mm-hmm. five best players. Uh, so I think it's going to be very important for uh, the Warriors trying to find a way to disrupt those other guys because this will kind of transition into our next question. Uh, but I'm sure we can agree on paper, Curry's teammates are more explosive uh, than Doncic's teammates. Uh, so the Mavs not getting their rhythm is a major key in this series because I think Luka's going to Luka. It's just like, can he get help? Because we saw Giannis mm-hmm. against the Celtics. Giannis was Giannis. I know there was a couple games he didn't shoot as good, but that was a great defense. But he put up the numbers to lead his team to a series win. Did not get the help. Luka, though, got enough help in the last five games of the series against the Suns. Absolutely, yeah. So role players is definitely going to be significant for the Dallas Mavericks on how they're constructed. Because as you mentioned, we'll talk about this a little bit later as far as star versus star power and kind of how teams are constructed. But um, you know, it's part role player, but also going to be part coaching, I think is going to be a massive key. And we know Steve Kerr and his bona fides, Jason Kidd, this is, uh, I think as far as he's ever gotten as a coach, uh, in the NBA playoffs and just kind of looking at, um, you know, obviously home teams have more of an advantage than road teams. The Warriors are six and oh at home in the playoffs so far, uh, this postseason. Uh, you look at how Dallas has performed uh, on the road this postseason, with the exception of a massive blowout. I think like that's like an anomaly, winning one twenty three to ninety on the road in Phoenix. Wasn't uh, that's that close? A, that, even. That's a one off. But you look at the the other road games that they've had. Lost in Phoenix earlier in that series, one ten to eighty. Dropped the first two games to Phoenix, one twenty nine, one hundred nine, one twenty one to one fourteen. And even going to the Jazz series, I mean, winning on the road to close out that series, that was only 98 to 96. Um, you know, they had another loss uh, as, as well on the road in Utah. So in part, it's, you know, role players play better at home. But how is then Jason Kidd going to try to get that same level of performance on the road? Um, I don't think that it's any more or less difficult to shoot a basketball in one gymnasium or another. It's going to be on the coach, Jason Kidd, to find a way to get the role players to be in more successful positions, because as you said, Jalen Brunson, Spencer Dinwiddie, um, what they provide offensively, Powell, what he provides, you know, in the post a little bit, as far as, you know, cleaning up rebounds, Max Kleba, of course, another role player that we got, you know, that we saw get hot at one point. I think he was like eight for eight from three uh, in that Utah jazz series type of thing. You know, Dallas doesn't have a set baseline of points for like, a bunch of players outside of Luka. It's kind of like, okay, who's going to step up and have a really big game? I think a massive key is going to be uh, Jason Kidd figuring out how to get those guys to be successful because spotty results so far on the road in the playoffs and with it being four games in Golden State and three in Dallas, that's going to be pretty significant. Yeah, one last thing as far as keys goes, uh, I think that that game seven should have helped the Mavs. I think Uh, Jason Kidd's got to get in Dinwiddie's and Brunson's ears and tell them, look, Spencer, you had 30 points in game seven on the road. Uh, Jalen, you had 24 points uh, in game seven on the road. So I actually think uh, those guys got to be confident. Uh, By the way, like who's going to be the number two guy for Luca? It's been Jalen Brunson consistently. He's averaging 23 a game uh, in the playoffs. I'll get into this a little bit when we make our series pick. Uh, but is Jalen Brunson a 23-point scorer? Probably not. But is he, a, is he a guy that maybe is getting close to becoming a consistent number two option? Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. It'll mm-hmm. definitely be uh, a lot of fun. I do want to talk about the the superstars, though, Tom, in this series. 
Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's a key in and of itself. And the two biggest names that we have, uh, Steph Curry for Golden State, Luka Doncic for uh, Dallas. And it's kind of like an interesting question. I guess it depends, you know, how big, how big a scale you want to view these two stars. I think it's going to kind of play into the answer a little bit. Um, but who is a bigger star for you? Is it Steph Curry, who's been doing this for longer, is more in the general zeitgeist given his uh, March Madness heroics? At general Davidson. what? Zeitgeist. Just understanding societal, you know, societally, we know Steph Curry. We've known him for such a long okay. time, whereas okay. Luca is relatively new on the scene. And also Luca being from a different part of the world, unless you're like a hardcore basketball fan. Zeitgeist. You don't really know who Luca is until he gets, you know, until that draft night trade between Atlanta and Dallas. So who's a bigger star and for what reasons? Lamon, I want to say this correctly. I just want to make sure I understood it correctly. Zeitgeist? Zeitgeist. Zeit, like sight, but Zeit? Yeah, Z-E-I-T-G-E-I-S-T. Can I get the language of origin on that one? Language of, I'm, I'm pulling it up now. Okay. Um, let's see. So it is a German. Okay, German. All right, good to know. I'll have to bring that up to my dad because he's he knows a lot of languages. So uh, again, another vocabulary word I'm learning from Tom. <laughs> uh, I think the way you framed the question, Tom, is uh, kind of basically my answer because I think this is sure. a very a very tough question. Uh, I think if you just take a look at like popularity, if you look at NBA All Star Game voting, if you look at who's been capped in the last few years, it's like. LeBron gets the most votes and Steph Curry gets the second most votes. Uh, LeBron is known for what he does on the court, off the court, all time great. Curry revolutionized the game with the three. I mean, I'm leaning, you know, Giannis, maybe the best player in the game. Maybe it's Luka. I mean, Jokic and Embiid, those guys are in the discussion. Maybe they're even better than Curry, uh, you know, Durant and LeBron at this point. But if I had to like, still put a face on the league it's lebron one and curry one a i think curry is the most popular player maybe with the exception of lebron uh so in that way it's curry uh, obviously as you mentioned longevity of career curry has been doing this for a long time uh, but if you're asking who's the bigger stars and who's a better player and this could change mm -hmm. in any given series i think if steph curry gets hot from the floor he is more unstoppable than Luca if he's hot. Uh, but consistently at the moment, Luca's a better player. Luca had more points, more rebounds, more assists in the regular season. Here's a crazy statistic for you. In the postseason, Luca's shooting better from three than Steph. 31.5 yeah. points per game, 10.1 rebounds, and 6.6 .6 assists for Luca. Uh, he is, you know, he, he's got some role players who are stepping up, but he's the unquestioned leader of the Mavs he's doing more than Curry is for his team as LeBron mentioned in a recent interview he loves Luka and I know they mentioned this on inside the NBA he kind of reminds them of LeBron he controls the game in so many different ways he can rebound he can assist he can score he's got a lot more moves than Curry he's very crafty uh, I mean I think a prime Steph Curry Versus current Luca, that's a tough debate. I don't know who is a better player uh, if we're debating prime Steph Curry. Uh, but at the moment, this season, uh, this has actually been Steph's worst season uh, in a while. If you look at his mm -hmm. percentages and where he's shooting, he's still very good. There's no denying Steph Curry is still an amazing player and he can drop 50 on you like that. Uh, but currently... Uh, Luca is actually a better basketball player, not by a lot. It's close, uh, but I would say Curry's here and Luca's here. Uh, so Luca's a better player. Curry's still a bigger name. So I would argue that they're pretty much just even as mm -hmm. far as star power. Uh, but I think it's great because you look at who the best players left in the playoffs are. All due respect to Jason Tatum. All due respect to Jimmy Butler. No question about it. With Giannis, Durant gone, Embiid gone, Jokic, LeBron isn't is in the playoffs. These are by far the two biggest names left in the playoffs, and that's who everyone's going to be looking for. How are those guys going to play? Yeah, so I, I mean, it's difficult to disagree, you know, with anything that you said. Um, I'm going to flip 
you know, that, that slight, you know, Steph and, and Luca, I'm going to flip it a little bit um, because I think part of stardom, at least if we're talking about like today, you know, is Dallas kind of taking the casual NBA fan by storm where I'm sure like a lot of people know who Lo- who Luca is if you're a casual basketball fan, but now people are going to start paying attention because he's been out in the playoffs uh, in the first round, you know, so far in his career, this is the farthest that he has advanced uh, to the Western conference finals. And I think he's also going to be a bit more notable as a star than say Steph Curry, because they're just at different points in their career right now. I mean, Steph has been MVP. He's been, you know, probably the best player on a championship team, even though he didn't win the, you know, a finals MVP type still of thing. Missing it. Still and he's missing still, it. And he's a he's a different kind of star than Luca is. Um, and the, I, I heard this point from a Brian Geltzeiler, uh, who covers the NBA. And basically the way he said it is that Luca is the type of superstar who's not going to play well with another superstar around him. Basically, um, He's not too terribly dissimilar from Dirk Nowitzki in that regard, where if you look at that championship Mavs team, you had a superstar in Dirk and then a lot of really good complimentary pieces around him that basically just accentuated everything that he did and played off of him. Luca is somebody who you mentioned all those stats in terms of points, rebounds, assists. He needs to have the ball in his hands to be really, really effective. Whereas you look at Steph, Steph doesn't have as many rebounds, as many assists, um, at least in, in this particular season, because it's a bit of a down year. Um, but he's also been, he's always been comfortable both with the ball in his hands as a point guard, but also moving off the ball, flowing in an offense, capable of working with Clay Thompson, who's a great shooter, capable of working with Draymond Green, who's a good facilitator as a four five type player, capable of playing with Kevin Durant. Steph Curry is a star in terms of, you know, he's got superpowers, but is also able to step back and let other guys shine. Whereas for Luca to be at his most effective, he has to have the ball in his hands, which means we're watching him a lot more than we're watching Steph. Um, so that's why I say at this point in career, if we're talking like overall totality, Steph's a bigger star. But if we're looking at who's playing the best basketball right now, who is the star of the playoffs right now, I'm going to go with Luka Doncic on that one. Yeah, I think you brought up a great point there. It's something I hadn't really thought about. I mean, I think obviously anytime you're a great player like Luka, you're going to be great no matter who you play with. But it does, like, as you mentioned, it's something to think about. Like, mm-hmm. you know, how would Luca play with Steph, for example? And uh, there's a lot oh, of credit. Be deadly. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> he'd be deadly because, you know, he'd get the looks. But I'm talking about, like, he wants control of the game. Sure. Like, Steph Curry has always been able to step back. And obviously him having a Clay and a Jordan Poole, there's some nights where Clay and Jordan Poole are going to be hotter. And Steph has always been willing to give the hot hand the ball. And that doesn't always translate in assists. I think part of the reason with Steph and assists is that Draymond gets so much of the ball, too. Because oh, sure. if you look at uh, Steph before Draymond emerged as a guy, Steph was getting higher assist numbers uh, than he is now. I don't think that it speaks to, you know, his inability to pass, because I think he's one of the best passing players in the league, a very underrated uh, skill of his. Uh, but I hadn't thought about that Luka uh, argument. And maybe that's why a guy like Giannis and Luca do like having a bunch of good role players and still want to be the guy. Maybe it's easier for their game, especially like if you think about it, like Luca is, is a solid shooter an improving shooter. He's not necessarily like lights out. Giannis is probably a better example, not necessarily a great shooter. So, I mean, it's like, if you, if you double team someone like, you know, Giannis isn't going to benefit from open three pointers because that's not his game. Right. So something to think about, but uh, I agree at the moment, Luca is uh, is the better player uh, than Steph right now, today. That could change, though. If Steph gets hot, that could change. Yeah, I mean, we're going to have, we're, we can have this discussion again at the end of the series, depending on who comes out, which uh, leads into the next question of who do you have winning the series? Do you have Golden State? Do you have Dallas? And, uh, you know, as usual, we'll throw in the number of games that we think it's going to take. Yeah, this could definitely take seven games. I want to say, I want to preface this by saying as unpredictable as the NBA playoffs have been uh, and the NHL playoffs, we'll get into that, and sports in general. I've talked about this ad nauseum, to use a word you might like, Tom, on this show, but there's a lot more parity across sports across the world right now 
the gaps between like stars and next level players are really, really close. Uh, so I, I want to preface saying nothing will surprise me in this series. Uh, but I think I'll say two things. I'll say if the Warriors play the way they played against the Grizzlies and the Mavs play the way they played against the Suns, the Mavericks will win the series. However, I will flip and say that I think Golden State played a little bit worse uh, than where they can be against the Grizzlies, and the Mavs played a little bit better than where they are against the Grizzlies. So I'm going to take Golden State. Uh, I think they're going to step up their three-point shooting. Uh, They shot 34% from three against the Grizzlies. Uh, They won in six games, but uh, that speaks to how good their defense is and how clutch they are in close games. Uh, And I think I look at this series similar to the Grizzlies series. Like if we have a blowout, the Mavs might blow out the Warriors in a given night because the Warriors are cold and the Warriors might get a blowout when they're hot. Uh, But if it comes down to a two, three point game, I mean, you know, you got Steph and Jordan Poole both shooting over 90% from free throws. Clay Thompson can make free throws, championship level pedigree. Uh, So I look at the Warriors. I think they're their shooting's going to improve in this series. Uh, meanwhile, the Mavs, I mean, we talked about this guy earlier. Uh, Jalen Brunson uh, averages about 23 points per game in this postseason. He was at about 16 in the regular season, and he was at about uh, 12 for his career. So he's definitely playing better than he's ever played before. Is he taking the next, next step in his career? Maybe. And I think he's going to be better than 16 a game, better than 12, certainly. But is that a guy we think is going to average 23 points per game in this series and for the rest of his career? I don't think so. I will take a term from you, a Tom Castleman term, regression to the mean. I think that uh, some of those Mavs guys who were just lights out in the last series, I think they're going to play a little bit worse. I think Jalen Brunson, Spencer Dinwiddie, uh, Dinwiddie, I don't think they're going to score 30 and 24, 28, 26. I don't think they're going to have explosive games like that every game this series and I do think Steph is going to shoot the ball much much better and this is the scary thing I said this at the all-star break Tom uh, that Steph when he won that three-point uh, he won the MVP with all those threes I said that he's missing the NBA finals MVP and even though he hasn't played as good this year I feel like the regression is going to go up he's missed so many threes he's got to start making them Uh, So I like the Warriors to win, uh, but I think this could be a seven-game series. I'll say Warriors in seven. I think that uh, playoff experience will help them. Uh, Mm -hmm. The Mavs haven't been here before. The Warriors have been here. Similar story, the last series against the Grizzlies. I think we saw that in the close games. And Phoenix, quite frankly, I know they made the finals last year, but other than that, Phoenix hadn't been there either. You know, they had that one, if you want to say maybe – fluke run with them getting there to the finals last year maybe maybe not but this is a whole different animal the Mavs are facing so I'll go Golden State in a close series because I think they'll be better than they were in the last series but if they play the way they played the second half of the season if the Mavs play the way they played against the Suns Mavs could win this series keep this in mind uh they won three out of four in the regular season against the Warriors as well so I'm like 50 152% sure on the Warriors. Not all that confident. Yeah, I'm going to say Warriors in seven as well. I think it comes down to that, um, you know, Golden State has more stars and they have stars that can play in a role player kind of sense. If that makes sense, they're they're able to play their system very, very well. Um, You know, these guys know each other. They've been in big moments. And um, I think, you know, getting a little long in the tooth to be sure, but um, there will be a couple of games where Dallas is just going to get them. But what it comes down to for me is Golden State's going to be able to play their brand of basketball because they don't have to worry about a Steven Adams. Uh, they don't have to worry about, um, you know, like anybody else as far as, you know, heavy rebounding uh, goes. So, I mean, you look at the the playoff numbers, Dallas is the second worst rebounding team in the playoffs uh, so far. Brooklyn is the only team that is worse. So Dallas is pulling down 37 boards a game. By comparison, Golden State's up at 44 rebounds a game. So I think without a clear, consistent way of stealing away possessions as far as getting offensive rebounds, 
Um, I think that the better shooting team, the overall talented team, Golden State's going to win out. Even if they're not as consistent and well-oiled as they were a few years ago, uh, give me Golden State in the Western Conference series. Yeah, I think real quickly to add to that, I think it's a good matchup for Golden State. Yeah, I know it's mm -hmm. Grizzlies per present more size as far as rebounding, but all due respect to Steven Adams, not really a scorer. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of what we saw in that last series is very parallel in this one. I do think Luka's a little bit better player than John Morant, though. Uh, but I'll say this, like, in that last series, we looked at it as the Warriors and Grizzlies both are going to score on the perimeter, and some of that is driving to the hoop with Ja, I know that. But they're both relying on perimeter players to score, just like the Mavericks are. But I look at the Warriors perimeter players, even though I think Luka's better right now, I think that I take Jordan Poole, Clay Thompson uh, over – uh, Jalen Brunson, Dinwindy, Bullock, etc. So I think that they play a similar type game. The Warriors just do it better, just a little bit better. Absolutely. So talking about a couple of uh, teams that were well suited to match up in Golden State and in Dallas, we have something pretty similar, if not the exact same. Uh, we've got a little Spider-Man meme going where they're both pointing at each other between the Miami Heat and the Boston Celtics. Uh, Common, what are some of the keys for the top-seeded Miami Heat? Um, as, as, as a contrast really quickly to the Western Conference where we have the three and four seed, here are the top two teams in the regular season for the Eastern Conference are meeting up in the finals. So um, we'll start with Miami, the, the home teams down in South Beach. What are some of the keys for the Heat? As I knock my mic down, uh, you still <laughs> hear me, right? Oh, yeah. All right, so uh, the biggest key for the Heat, and I do want to say one thing real quickly. I didn't mention this earlier. And I was going to mention it later, but if you look at the regular season, the top four best teams in points allowed in the NBA, as in least points allowed, can you guess what the four are? Is regular season? Regular season. And they're similar in the postseason, too. Yeah, I would say, you know, because we're talking about them, Miami, Boston, probably Milwaukee has a really good defensive team. And then maybe like Utah? No, it was... Uh, heat and this is no particular order i have this written down somewhere but uh, the top four defenses in the regular season were the heat the mavericks the celtics uh and uh the warriors this is strictly in points per wow. game allowed least points per game allowed i know there's different metrics to uh, measure statistics but the top four best defensive teams in the nba are all uh in the are, are, final four. Does that mean defense is back to winning championships? Could be. Could Offenses be. Hey. are dead. And what happened to the super teams? I mean, like, Clay's a very good player. Jason Brown, or is a very good, not Jason Brown, Jalen Brown. I'm getting Jason Tatum and, Jay, uh, and uh, Jalen Brown mixed up. I mean, uh, they're pretty good. They're close, but they don't have that same super team feel to it. But uh, Miami, of, of any of the teams, uh, along with, Dallas doesn't really have a consistent second option. So there's the biggest key for Miami is going to be who's going to be the second scorer to Jimmy Butler because Jimmy Butler is averaging 28.7 points per game in the playoffs. We talked about this last week, regular season, Jimmy Butler and playoff Jimmy Butler are very different. Uh, so regular season, Jimmy Butler is a very good player. He's, you know, top 15 to 20 range Postseason Jimmy Butler is hands down a top 10 player in the game. You cannot tell me there are 10 guys that are better than Jimmy Butler in the postseason, mm -hmm. and the stats prove it on both ends. Uh, so he's going to deliver. He's going to do his thing. Uh, but who's going to be the second guy for Miami? Because Bam Adebayo is second in the playoffs at 14.6 points per game. Uh, Tyler Hero, an up-and-down shooter, third at 13.8. Uh, Kyle Lowry is banged up. He's, you know, he's – averaging six points per game when he plays he's not even going to play in the first game uh, so a huge key for Miami is going to be who is going to help out Jimmy Butler because we know uh, that with the Celtics they've got two guys in Tatum and Brown we don't know who the second level guy is going to be for the Celtics or not for the Celtics for the Heat so that's a huge key and the other big key for them is point guard play uh, Kyle Lowry is playing hurt uh, or not playing in this series. Uh, average, as I said, six points on 30% shooting uh, in the playoffs. Gabe Vincent has stepped in at point guard. He's averaging 7.5 points, three and a half assists, 
but shooting only 38% from the floor and 28% from three. So Victor Oladipo is a guy off the bench, but he's more of a shooting guard, uh, as is Jimmy Butler. So who's going to score the ball besides Jimmy Butler? And who's going to pass the ball uh, for Miami? They, there are some question marks. Their defense is great. They've got great role players. They have an incredible coach. But he's got to figure out who's going to be the guy uh, that gets buckets other than Jimmy Butler and who runs the offense. Because it is going to be a lot tougher against Boston. They got lucky with the Philly team where Embiid was hurt. Missed a couple games. Wasn't the same when he came back. James Harden's a shadow of himself. Uh, Miami kind of has gotten pretty easy matchups early on in the playoffs. It's going to be a whole different story against the juggernaut Celtics. Yeah, I mean, if anybody's going to figure it out, it's Eric Spolstra. And, like, I got to come clean and say, like, Eric Spolstra's developed into one of the best coaches in the NBA. Um, because, quite frankly, like, when he came on the scene, he took over for Pat Riley um, and just steps right into, you know, the the heatles with LeBron and Wade and Bosch and everything. It's like, okay, he's getting, you know, he's winning championships. He's, he's getting all these accolades because he has great players around him. And what has happened since has been nothing short of remarkable uh, for Eric Spolster as a coach. Um, it's going to be tall timber for him to find, you know, a secondary score to Jimmy Butler, perhaps even to find like a primary score because Boston has an incredible defense. They have, you know, three guys that easily I can think of off the top of my head who can match up with Jimmy Butler and really make him work in terms of Marcus Smart, Jason Tatum, who's showing some good defensive chops and Jalen Brown as well. So, who is that second guy? I think that is the biggest key, you know, period, paragraph, end of story. Is it going to be Max Struess, you know, DePaul's own uh, shooting guard who's had uh, some some really fun moments of success uh, in these NBA playoffs? You Perhaps. don't want that to be your second leading score. I'll tell you that you, much. You don't You're want that, no. You don't want that, no. Like, I mean, we haven't really talked about Bam Adebayo. I mean, here's an advantage for the Heat, a key, if you will, is that um, – and this kind of plays into the whole they match up well with the Boston Celtics. They can leave Bam Adebayo at the five because they don't really have to worry about all that much front court depth on Boston side. So they at least have that advantage going into this playoff series where you can put Adebayo on the floor and then just surround him with Jimmy Butler, Hero, Struess, you know, PJ Tucker getting some minutes as a big man. Um, you know, maybe Duncan oh, Robinson. Big man. He's like a some, small forward. That's what's funny. Height, but he plays like a power forward. He's yeah. like a he's like he's like the the poorest man's Charles Barkley. Like the absolute poorest that man's Charles Barkley. He's a very, very poor man's yeah, Charles Barkley. That's what Barkley. I'm saying. I, not not a very poor Holy man. Cow. The, the poorest man's Char, Charles Barkley. Begging um, for pennies at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Just milk uh, money. Who, we're just glad that uh, they they've lengthened the the athletic shorts a little bit. You know, is how are they going to get Duncan Robinson going as uh, somebody who's been a pretty significant scorer off the bench? So I agree with you 100 percent on the keys for the Miami Heat. Flipping it over to the Boston Celtics, um, what are some of the keys for the Celtics for you? Ime Udoka has done a fantastic job succeeding where. Um, I'm blanking. Brad Stevens, uh, where he could not in getting Boston this far. Um, what are the keys for the Celtics in this one? Uh, yeah, so first off, uh, I want to say this. Bam out of bio, real quickly on the Heat one. Mm -hmm. He's got to be the second guy. He's got to take his game to the next level. He's not necessarily a great post player, but I think he has some abilities. Uh, as for the Celtics, this is going to sound really cliche and simple, and you might have something else, and maybe we can talk about multiple stuff, but the biggest key for the Celtics is Jason Tatum. I'm going to read off some stats for you, Tom. Uh, Jason Tatum, in the three losses against the Bucs, he shot 33%, 21%, and 41% from the floor. In the four wins, he shot 50%, 46%, 53%, and 50%. The Bucs are a great defensive team. The Heat are even better. Uh, so. Uh, how how good is Jason Tatum going to play? It's the same it's the same concept as uh, you know a guy taking his game to the next level. I said Steph Curry. Are we going to see MVP level Steph Curry or not? Which Jason Tatum are we going to see? Because he's been 
pretty inconsistent in these playoffs. He's had some great shooting games where he goes for 40 plus and he's had some duds of games. Uh, so I think if, if he has four great games, Boston can win this series, but if he struggles, it could get, you know, it could get wide open. Uh, so it's a very, very simple key. Uh, but I think Jason Tatum is trying to be a first level superstar. He's knocking on the door. He's a very good player. And I, I've said this many times on this show, the difference between the first best player in the league and the 10th, even 11th or 12th player is really close. There's so many great players and not necessarily one that clearly stands above anyone else. Uh, but right now, like Jason Tatum wants to be a top five player in the game. And if you have to rank them, I don't know anyone that's going to realistically tell me that Jason Tatum is a top five player in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, so Jason Tatum, you want to get there, man, play like it. Uh, so Tatum playing like a superstar is going to be a major key uh, from Boston. Absolutely. I think that, um, I mean, this is popping up relatively breaking on the show. Um, just a couple minutes ago, uh, Al Horford, Marcus Smart out for game one tonight, Tuesday night uh, for the Heat. So perhaps health could end up being a significant key That's as fine. far as Boston goes. Um, just to clarify really quickly, Marcus Smart out with a foot injury. He was questionable uh, leading up to today's game, and they're holding him out game one. Al Horford looks like he's in the uh, COVID health protocols, um, which is why he's missing game one. So not 100% sure what's going there as I'm just kind of reading off headlines. But I think it's um, in, in addition to um, kind of playing off, rather, uh, Jason Tatum, it's going to be who else is going to step up around. Because I think that both teams, as you mentioned, uh, Common, great on the defensive end. And the, the focal point for defense is going to be stopping Jimmy Butler on one side, stopping Jason Tatum on the other. So is Jalen Brown going to step up and show that he is the third best player in the series as opposed to, say, Bam Adebayo? He is. You know, what, what, can, what can Al Horford or Robert Williams III do to kind of punish Miami inside a little bit, try to contain Bama at a bio a little bit and allow the stars, Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum to kind of carry the day. I think it's going to be role players coming up with a significant, um, going to have a significant say in how this series turns out, you know, Derek white, how is he going to play um, as, as the series goes on? Boston isn't too terribly deep. I mean, we rattled off a bunch of different names for Miami because they play a fairly deep rotation uh, with everybody having pretty well-defined roles. But um, especially if you're looking at Marcus Smart and Al Horford out for game one, that rotation shortens up really, really quickly uh, for Boston. So I think that's going to be a significant uh, key for the Celtics. Um, so that leads us up to, you know, the big question on the Eastern Conference. We both have the Warriors representing the West. Do you have South Beach or Beantown going to the NBA Finals? I said I was like 51% sure on the Warriors, 52%. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty much at like 50.1 on this one. I know it sounds yeah. like a cop-out, but uh, it truly is an absolute toss-up. And Al Horford, by the way, is going to be an important key because Al Horford had that like 30-point playoff game uh, against the Bucks in that huge win I think the Celtics had. Uh, he's a former All-Star, but he's played like really, really good lately. He's been a kind of a pleasant surprise for Boston. Uh, mm -hmm. So if he's playing the way he is, they did win without Mark to smart against the box. Keep that in mind, sure. uh, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens. I'm going to go. I'm very torn, but I'm going to go with the Celtics for two reasons. First and foremost, I'm going to say the Celtics because I've bet against them twice in a row and I've been wrong twice in a row. Ask have you been. Uh, Tom, mm -hmm. so uh, I'm just going to say I'm not going to do this again. I'm not going down this rabbit hole of picking against the Celtics because they've done me dirty. I'm going to pick four of them. I'm going to pick four Boston. Uh, and sure enough, you know, this will be the series. They finally proved some of the stuff I said earlier uh, wrong. But I, I think Boston is going to win the series. Uh, I do think this Horford injury and this smart injury could hurt them. Uh, but I do think that Miami probably uh, might have had the edge in game one just because they're not coming off of game seven. Uh, I know that it's weird because Miami's the betting favorite in game one. Mm -hmm. And maybe we'll have more on this in locks of the week. But Boston is the series favorite. So that is just kind of like a, like a weird, weird thing uh, to keep in mind here. But 
Uh, I do think Boston is capable of winning on the road. They won two out of three in Milwaukee, and they won two games in Brooklyn. So they're actually, I believe, four and one on the road in these playoffs. Like, they are doing really well on the road. Uh, and we talked a lot about a lot about this. The Heat don't have a second score. They don't. They don't know who it's going to be. Maybe that's a good thing, but I lean on it being a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the Celtics do have two scores. They've got Tatum and Brown. And you look at these two teams, they're both amazing defensive teams. And Tom, to your credit, even though you did pick the Bucs to win, uh, you went on the show and you told us Bucks celtics is going to be a defensive showdown. And it was, for the most part. There were some games where Giannis went off, some games Tatum sure, went yeah. off. Stars are going to be stars, but if you look at the total points scored in that series, relatively low scoring. Look for that again in this series. This is going to be a low scoring series. Uh, and, you know, that maybe that's a tease to my locks of the week. Uh, but I, I think that Boston is just a little bit better offensively. Uh, they've got two great scores, two players who can ISO uh, themselves and score. I know they got to move the ball. Sometimes they get too ISO heavy, but they do have mm -hmm. two guys who can beat you off the ISO. Uh, the Heat maybe have one, maybe. So uh, I think that Boston has uh, just a, a little bit better scoring, a little bit better offense. Uh, so I'll take Boston in a seven-game series. Again, seven games. And, yes, I'll pick Boston on the road in game seven. Uh, but uh, it's totally a toss-up. Yeah, I think um, I'll say a very confident uh, Boston in seven games in this one. I think it's going to go the distance in part because with a couple key injuries, Miami's going to have an advantage in game one. But um, if we want to say it's a six-game series and you got to win four, I think Miami, or, uh, Boston can definitely win uh, four out of the next six if Miami is, in fact, able to you know grab game one, maintain home court advantage. Um, just looking at how they match up, uh, you look at defensive three point percentage, Boston giving up 33 or 32.9% Miami giving up 33.2%. But then when you flip it around to, you know, team makes, um, Miami's a 32% three point shooting team, whereas Boston's at 37. So Boston, a little bit better on the offensive end in that regard. I mean, they're pretty much straight up and down, even as far as like rebounds and and defensive points per game goes and that sort of thing. So give me Boston. I think they've had the uh, the tougher path so far in, in this Eastern Conference playoffs. Question. I think that, um, you know, not that Miami isn't legitimate, but they haven't been challenged in quite the same way, even with uh, their series in Philadelphia. Uh, they felt It felt fairly comfortable uh, with Miami closing that one out. So... Uh, give me Boston in seven, and we're going to have, I think, an outstanding finals between Golden State and uh, Boston. Yeah, and real quickly, this is a matchup of that uh, bubble showdown a couple years ago, which Miami did win, by the way. So uh, keep keep that in mind for sure. It's going to be it's going to be a tough series, uh, but I do agree with you. I think the Celtics are uh, just a little bit better, a little bit better scores, a little bit more seasoned team. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not seasoned necessarily because the Heat were in the finals, but I think they're, they're very seasoned. Yeah, they're, they're playing. They're playing better right now. Second half of the season, uh, Boston was the best team in the league, and that's the real Boston. Uh, that is the real Boston that came to play, and they kind of said it: new coach, new system, uh, injuries early on. Uh, but a key is going to be uh, Boston's three-point shooting because. They can shoot well, but they're very streaky. Like Jason Tatum can be up and down. Uh, that whole team can be up and down. So uh, are they up more or are they down more? I know that sounds very cliche, but they're not extremely consistent, but they're very streaky. So if they can be streaky, uh, they should win this series. We agree. Boston in seven, Golden State in seven. And I'm sure, you know, we'll talk more about this in a few weeks, but I'm sure we both like the Warriors. I'll say that's my one saving grace because I've butchered the Eastern Conference picks, <laughs> uh, as have you, quite frankly. But the Warriors yep. are my saving grace. They've been my champion uh, all along, and I'll stick with it. Yeah, we've certainly been uh, a little more missed than hit uh, on that front. Uh, but we'll shift over to the ice as we have the NHL great first round of the playoffs uh, we had five Game 7s. We had Tampa Bay over uh, Toronto in a Game 7. 
We had the Hurricanes over the Bruins in a Game 7. Rangers over Penguins in a Game 7 after the Penguins wow. were up 3-1 uh, to one in that series. Um, of course, an overtime win for the Calgary Flames. My pick to win it all, still alive, just Woo! barely defeating the Dallas Stars. And, of course, their opponent, the Edmonton Oilers, with Connor McDavid defeating uh, the L.A. Kings in a Game 7. So absolutely bonkers uh, in the NHL, which is just fantastic because it doesn't seem like there's necessarily a clear-cut favorite, in part because we don't, quite frankly, follow hockey all that closely. Um, but Common, just kind of touching on uh, some of those uh, those games that we just saw and what we see going forward, uh, what are you looking forward to in Lord Stanley Cup's playoff? Well, you said it best. There's no clear-cut favorite. I mean, look at teams like the Panthers and the Flames, some of the best records in the league. When have they ever done anything in hockey, quite frankly? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that in itself speaks to it. Uh, and you mentioned those five game sevens. Well, we had two of those go to overtime. Four of them were decided by one goal, and the other was decided by two goals. Uh, so it speaks to the parity. It speaks to uh, how evenly matched all of these teams are. It's wide open in the hockey playoffs. It is thrilling. I've actually caught myself turning to the third period in a close game, caught a little bit of playoff hockey, would like to catch some more. Uh, so definitely think that there is no clear cut favorite for sure. Uh, but, you know, who's most equipped to win? It's got to be the Lightning. They've won two seasons in a row. I mean, they could trifecta this. Uh, they did win game six on the road. Uh, they won game seven as well in their series. Actually, I think it was game seven was on the road. Uh, nonetheless, they were down 3-2. Uh, and they came back to win with a road win uh, against the Leafs. So Tampa is the most equipped. Uh, that's who I'm rolling with. Uh, but Nikita Kucherov is a great player, by the way. We talk a lot about superstars. He's definitely one of the most uh, underrated. Uh, mm -hmm. But it is definitely wide open in the NHL. And that is great, great to see. Yeah, it might, uh, might end up being the Colorado Avalanche. We talked about five out of the eight series had a game seven. Uh, Avalanche and uh, Nashville Predators didn't have a game five. That was a clean sweep right off the ice. Um, Avalanche looking pretty scary in how they dominated the Nashville Predators. Um, that's a team to be concerned about, especially because, you know, I'm rolling with Calgary. I've, I've adopted them for at least this iteration <laughs> of, of the adopted team. I love oh, it. Of course. Tom. Yeah. I mean, the Blackhawks for multiple reasons have um, done everything in their power to make me not root for them. Um, so yeah, I'm going to roll with the flames to, to still win it all, but avalanche uh, a potential matchup uh, in the conference finals is definitely worrisome. Um, let alone getting past the Edmonton Oilers and Connor McDavid. So uh, give me the Flames to win it all, but Avalanche, definitely a worrisome team as well. Yeah, look, up, look out for Connor McDavid, superstar. I love him. Uh, and definitely do your homework. Start memorizing Flames names if you're adopting the team. I got Johnny Flames Goudreau. He, he is the go-to guy. Scored the game-winning goal in Game 7. That's all I really need. All right, there you go. You're ready to go, man. All Absolutely. right, looking forward to it. Yeah, and then moving on to uh, baseball, because that's enough of hockey talk and ice talk. Uh, just really briefly, uh, kind of touching on the New York Yankees, going like 1930-something on everybody, 25-9, and nine, absolutely just mashing the baseball. Uh, Kama, do you think that they are for real, or do you think that there is some regression to the mean in store for the Bronx Bombers? Uh, they're absolutely for real. I mean, are they going to average 25 and nine wins the rest of the season? Maybe not. There might be a slight regression, but I don't think it's going to be significant. I think this is, this team is absolutely for real. Uh, and I think part of the Yankees problem the last few seasons has been injuries. What do we have right now? We've got judge and Stan are healthy. Anthony Rizzo, by the way, what a great addition. You got yourself a left-handed hitter that has the shortest right field porch in the majors. You wonder why Rizzo has 10 home runs. He's got that short right field. He's got to barely hit it. It's a can of corn in some other parks. But Rizzo is taking advantage of that uh, short right field. He's got a bunch of his home runs are at home. You wonder where mm -hmm. those stats are right there. Uh, so 
By the way, look at these guys they have. Some of these guys are a little past their prime, but their lineup has Stanton, Judge Rizzo, uh, Joey Gallo, DJ LeMahieu, Josh Donaldson. I mean, these are some of baseball's best players over the last five, six years. The lineup is ridiculous, but the biggest key perhaps has been their pitching staff. The Yankees mm -hmm. have the best earned run average in baseball, 2.72 ERA. That's where the regression to the mean might happen a little bit. I actually think their lineup, uh, they're leading the majors in home runs. I expect that to continue. I can see their pitching dropping off a little bit, uh, but I think they're, they're pretty good. I, think, I do think Garrett Cole and company will continue to pitch the ball well. And at my girlfriend's birthday, uh, after we went to the zoo, we were at the bar, and I, I was watching the Bucks game while talking, of course, you know, celebrating her birthday. They also sure. had the White Sox game on, and I was keeping my eye on that as well. And on the screen, uh, flashed some statistics. It was like best starts in Yankees history. And I wish I had screenshotted this, but it was like something like this was one of their seven best starts. This might be off by one or two, so don't quote me on it. Mm -hmm. But I believe it was one of their seven best starts in the history of the team. And in the previous six, they won five World Series and lost another. Uh, so when the, I know this is different years. I know this is the classic who cares thing, but there's something to be said about Yankees getting off to a start like this. Dare I say this, they might be breaking their curse uh, since 2009 is the last time they won the world series, which for the Yankees seems like forever. I mean, they were winning like three in a row in the late nineties, early two thousands. It felt like, they were just as likely to win the World Series as they weren't. Uh, so they might be breaking that drought this year. I think the Dodgers uh, obviously are a threat. Uh, that's probably the other most talented team in the league. Uh, but New York in a great division that they play in. Uh, you know, Red Sox are underachieving. Classic Boston does great one year, bad the next. Uh, but the Blue Jays and the Rays are no joke. I know they've done some of those wins against teams away from the division. but the fact that that was their start in that division is wild. Uh, so I absolutely, I think the Yankees are the real deal. And I do think they're going to keep this up. Uh, you know, they're going to keep it up. I think they're a real team and they're a dangerous team. I do not want to face those guys. And uh, Aaron Judge, man, he's going to win the MVP this year. He is something else. Yeah, I think Yankees are for real as well. I mean, if you look at run differential, which isn't the you know necessarily the the, the all being indicator of how good a team is, but it's a pretty good indicator um, of how many more runs you score than you give up. Yankees lead baseball seventy three, a plus seventy three run differential. Dodgers are second at plus seventy two, and just kind of scrolling through here, I think next up on the list is actually the Angels at plus 54. So we might be looking at a, a classic, you know, if you can say blue blood in baseball, Yankees and Dodgers, the two teams um, that I think have won the most World Series. Actually, it might be St. Louis has won the second most World St. Series. St. Louis is second, I think. Certainly, and Dodgers are third, I, I believe. Yeah, like certainly two historic franchises that it'd be really fun to see them matched up in October as well. I think the Yankees are for real for a couple different uh, reasons. Obviously, you mentioned... Uh, you know, the pitching has been going really, really well and that there might be some regression there. I'm not quite so certain because this is a story I've been kind of like keeping tabs on with baseball. Um, and that is the actual baseball. Um, what MLB seems to have done is um, they put they put humidors in all the different ballparks to try to get a consistent product. And what has ended up happening is that the product is consistently a deader baseball um, than what it sometimes is. So bigger picture MLB has kind of used two different baseballs and they say, Oh, there's some variance in terms of like different shipments coming in. It's not quite as standard as it ought to be. Um, so there's a really lively baseball and a more dead baseball. Well, if you have a more dead baseball, what's going to end up happening is that guys that are hitting home runs to like the first or second row, those are now turning into flyouts in the outfield. What are the Yankees known for with their team? You mentioned the names, Giancarlo Stanton, Aaron Judge, Joey Gallo, Josh Donaldson, Anthony Rizzo with that short porch as a lefty, uh, Joey Gallo, a left-handed hitter as well. Uh, these are guys that are strong and they're going to hit a ball far anyway. 
So maybe they're not going, you know, concourse shots necessarily as with a live baseball, but even with a, a, a softer, you know, more difficult to drive baseball, the Yankees are still able to knock it out of, out of the park in the way that most other teams just don't have those types of bats. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like nerdy to be talking about like the actual product it itself that you. the players are using. Um, but I, I think that's going to be a significant significant reason as to why it seems like the Yankees and the Dodgers are going to continue uh, this tear to start off the season is because they have the biggest and best bats in baseball on their team. Um, so you're taking out a little bit of that variance that other teams might have to their advantage. I mean, ball just has to go over the fence. If it goes 400 or 450 feet, but when you start bringing that number down, the guys that are hitting at 450 are still clearing the fence. The guys that are hitting it closer to 400 feet, they're not. Interesting. I, I, I actually, I'll be completely honest with you, Tom. I wasn't aware of those physics. So thank you very mm-hmm. much for literally enlightening me about the baseballs. <laughs> so uh, real, Every real now quickly, and again, I offer a nugget. Yeah, a couple other things to add real fast. 26 and 9 on the Yankees. We're recording mm. Tuesday at 551. Uh, So that record will obviously change. Just two real quick things. I know we'll do contender, pretender at some point for baseball. uh, But uh, something else to keep in mind, the Mets are also dominating the National League. Uh, So it's possible we see a Subway series. Not saying it's going to happen. Obviously, the Dodgers uh, are something else. But the Mets are a team that I set to look out for. Uh, It is kind of cool how both New York teams are doing great. I, I wonder if the humidifier settings are a little different in new york with with how good the teams are doing yeah no that takes me back to perhaps like the first real world series that i can remember clemens and piazza yeah like that's and it wasn't a particularly close series because you know the yankees Yankees were just so much better than everybody else but i think that's one of like the very first world series that i can like remember as far as like childhood goes i don't really remember the diamondbacks uh, winning the year prior yeah, um, see, I vividly remember the Diamondbacks as the first one, yeah, but I'm like, I'm a year, wow. I'm a year older than you, so that does yeah. make sense. That was the first one I remember. I remember the Yankees hitting like, uh, what's crazy? What I remember about that series is the Yankees had uh, these uh, great home runs late in that series against Boing Boing Kim or however you say his name, uh, the Diamondbacks closer at the time, but they still uh, came up. Kim? Yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah, they still came up short. And it was that game seven, Randy Johnson coming out of the bullpen, that Luis Gonzalez blooper. That was mm-hmm. the same day that Mike Brown got a pick six for the Bears against the Browns in overtime. The same that day remember. that Shane McMahon threw, I think it was not Shane, was it Shane McMahon? Was that the quarterback's name? Shane Matthews, maybe. Yes, for the Bears. Shane yeah. Matthews. I'm thinking Jim McMahon. Uh, Shane Matthews, I think it was, threw a Hail Mary. They got a touchdown on a Hail Mary late. I vividly remember that specific day in sports because I was supposed to go to a family party with my mom and the family friends we had. And I said, no, I'm good. I'm going to watch the Bears game and World Series game (laughs) seven. And I saw Hail Mary, a walk-off interception winner, and a little bloop, Luis Gonzalez, uh, getting things done off Rivera. So uh, those were wild times. So exciting stuff in New York. Mm -hmm. Real quickly, just off the top of your head, We'll keep it brief. I'll keep it brief as well. But maybe this is another reason why the Angels are doing so good, these baseballs. Uh, Los Angeles Angels have, some could argue, the two best players in baseball. Sure. Uh, Are the Angels for real? Because we know baseball is a team game. Uh, They're off to a great start. Actually, they're tied for first in their division with the Astros. Uh, Are the Angels a legitimate team, Tom? Oh, I'd say so. I'd say they're a legitimate team. You got Mike Trout. So long as he's healthy, he's the best player in baseball. Um, you've got, again, so long as he's healthy, uh, Shohei Otani. And for his health, I mean, with uh, with the arm, because a lot of his value is in pitching. But even hitting, uh, he's just incredible. So, um, you know, baseball's not one of those games where you think about if you have the two best players on the playing surface, you've got a really good chance of winning. Um, but because of everything that those two do, uh, I think the Angels are very, very for real. You know, not to mention guys like Anthony Anthony Rendon, uh, fantastic third baseman. So yeah, 
I like the Angels a lot. I think I had them going to the wild card as we did our preseason show, and I'm I'm really happy I picked that because I'm going to stick with them for sure. Yeah, I think they're getting the wild card as well. The Astros might edge them out in that division, but Angels are a playoff team. Patrick Sandoval, 1.91 ERA as a starter. And don't forget, they added Noah Syndergaard, who has been mm-hmm. pretty good as well. So Otani, Syndergaard, get those arms together. That's nasty. I do disagree with you. If we're talking about fully healthy, I think Otani's the best overall player because of what he adds with pitching. Trout may be the best overall, like, hitting, fielding uh, type player. Yeah. But, you know, apples and oranges, they're both great. Yeah, it, it, it just Shohei, like, Otani just changes the conversation because we think about, oh, best overall player is always a position player because they don't pitch. You know, we don't really consider that. I mean, Shohei's like the first guy since like 1920s something where we're considering both his pitching sure. and hitting prowess. So certainly uh, a fantastic player in that regard. A um, couple big other sporting events coming up. Uh, we'll touch on, I'm sorry, do we have like, do we PGA first or do you want to go to the ponies? No, let's do the PGA. I have PGA written up first. And actually, Tom, we'll do this next week as well. French Open. And my favorite Champions League soccer next week. So I'll we'll be, be hitting sure on to look up on on that. Yeah, we'll be hitting <laughs> on a lot of stuff across the sports world in the coming weeks. French Open, by the way, I think technically might start this weekend, but I know they've got qualifiers. But it'll be early on in the tournament, so we'll save that for next week. A little French Open tennis, but let's get rocking with the golf, and then we'll save the ponies uh, for the end. I might have a little pony story for you as well. Oh, nice. Um, so in terms of the PGA Championship, um, as far as picking winners go, Scotty Scheffler, who is wearing his newly pressed green jacket, is the betting favorite. Common, are you going with him to win another major, or are you going with somebody else in the field? Oh, I mean, if you're going to talk about like the field or him, definitely taking the field. Well, I'm I meant actually, like, some, like who else yeah. in the field if not him, yeah. Yes. Okay, so I'm looking this up right now. PGA Championship betting odds because I want to give the rundown. So my boy that I have is uh, number three on the betting odds. Actually, I'm looking at Scotty Scheffler and John Rahm are listed mm-hmm. as co-favorites according to Caesar's Sportsbook. Uh, but obviously, there's okay. different different. Yeah, Bovada has them a, a couple points off. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going with the third favorite. Uh, if you're looking at the Caesar's Sportsbook, I just pulled up online. Uh, Rory McIlroy at plus 1,600. Justin Thomas plus 1,600. Jordan Spieth plus 1,700. Uh, so Scotty and John Rahm at plus 1,200. So Rory and Justin Thomas tied for third. I like Rory McIlroy. I do, I do want to keep Jordan Spieth in mind as well because he did win uh, over Easter, as he tends to always do. Uh, he's won on like Easter like back-to-back years or something, which is really funny. But Rory McIlroy, you had him in betting locks of the week last week, mm. and you kind of got barbecued. He finished in fifth place, uh, but uh, he still didn't finish ahead of uh, one of the guys you needed him to finish ahead of. Uh, but just got fifth place in a tournament. Uh, he was second at the Masters. So we had Rory coming on big, played great at the Masters. So he's playing great golf right now. He's already won the PGA Championship twice in his career. So we know he knows that course pretty well and i love the fact that he's number three on the betting favorites it makes me feel good because he's not like the biggest favorite but he's like right there because typically a lot of times like the betting favorite doesn't win but it's usually like one of the main guys in that group that ends up winning so you know me tom uh, when i'm not sure i tend to go like rory or jordan speed those are like my my two picks that i just like to roll out there so let's let's run it back. Rory McIlroy uh, going to win the PGA Championship for the third time in his career. Yeah, you know me. When I don't know much about something, I just default to my adopted guys. I've got two of them. In this case, I like, uh, I like Morikawa and I like Matsuyama. I'm going to go with Colin Morikawa on this one. I think he's like the fifth or sixth betting favorite on Bovada, which is my... Uh, preferred site as far as looking up stuff for locks of the week. Uh, yeah, he's tied at sixth with uh, Patrick Cantlay at plus 2,000. So I'm not going to go so far as to lock that one in. I know I've been plus money <laughs> Castleman the past couple of weeks, but not at that rate. But uh, give me Colin Morikawa with Hideki Matsuyama as my kind of like 1A guy that I'm pulling for to win this PGA Championship. 
I like how we both have adopted golf players. We both adopted yeah. guys in golf. You're a Morikawa Matsuyama. I'm a Spieth McElroy. I like it. Absolutely. Yeah. As far as talking about, you know, locking in long odds, uh, the Kentucky Derby, I like this is a couple of weeks ago because we had a bye week last week, but I don't know if you saw the video, the overhead of, um, of course um, I did. I'm blanking on the horse's name. Rich uh, Strike. Rich Strike. Thank you. I knew it was something to do with like betting. It was like lucky bet or something like that. But Rich Strike, he had Epicenter holding off Zandon uh, going down the stretch. And I was showing it to, to Jenna because she doesn't really follow like horse racing all that much, but she does like horses. So it was like, you'll like this video about sports. And just <laughs> and, and it was really helpful having the graphics above and showing how Rich Strike basically took advantage of the fact that Epicenter was focused on Zandon, holding him off on the outer shoulder, and that opened up that inside lane for Rich Strike to go ahead and win the Kentucky Derby. So absolutely fantastic, an 80-1, to 1, the longest shot to win. Heading into Preakness Stakes, we will not be able to pick Rich Strike as a potential uh, Triple Crown winner. Uh, he was basically scheduled to not race uh, the Preakness Stakes, and winning the Kentucky Derby is not going to change that. So respect the trainer and the owner for uh, you know keeping an eye on the horse's health. Looking at the odds for this one, just to read off the top couple ones, Epicenter at plus 110, Early Voting at plus 400, Secret Oath at plus 450, and then we have some longer odds going after that. Uh, so, Common, do you go with the favorite on this one, Epicenter, who uh, I kind of like, um, or do you go somebody else in the field? So, I'll, I'll tease my pick. I'll tell you a story. It's funny you bring up Jenna uh, and horse racing. Well, my girlfriend, Allie, in horse racing, so uh, she's got, like, I guess it's like she's got some Native American blood in her. So, she's mm -hmm. got, like, that, like, casino, like, lucking, like, She's got that feel for things because she's not a sports person either in terms of like really sitting down and watching games. I mean, you know, I'm in my own category. I'm a nut. But uh, so I went to a Kentucky Derby party with her and her family and her uncle organized the whole Kentucky Derby betting thing where he had like the odds for the horses. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, Rich Strike was not on the board. However, he also had it done differently because Rich Strike was the longest odds one. He didn't put him on the board and he had it like in subsections where it was like the four lowest betting odds were in one section. So he just said like, if you bet on that section and Rich Strike won like afterwards, you are the winner of that money. But a lot of people bet on like the four lowest odds horses. So she ended up profiting, but not nearly as much uh, had she gone at 80 to one, because about 30 minutes before the race, she told me rich strike is going to win. She predicted it should have taken all the money I have and went and put it all on rich strike and listened to her. Cause my girlfriend correctly predicted rich strike, Alexandra Morgan at 81, uh, 80 to one odds. And it's funny that you were saying, some sort of lucky name. I kept calling him Lucky Strike. I've literally have mm -hmm. referred to him as Lucky Strike multiple <laughs> times in the last week. And she's like, Rich Strike, Rich Strike. And he is a Rich Strike because if you bet on Rich Strike, you struck it rich. Uh, but, I mean, Tom, it's, it's an ear of upsets. Uh, you know, again, I mentioned this earlier. There's more upsets in sports uh, now than ever before. So chances are it's going to be some long shot odds horse that wins however mm -hmm. i don't know which one it is so i'm gonna pick the favorite just because i feel like it's the most likely to win it uh epicenter is the favorite got second place at the kentucky derby uh, obviously the horse that beat him isn't in this race uh also as you mentioned he was probably not looking at that horse had he been aware of what rich strike was gonna do that race could have been different uh, I think Epicenter uh, is going to do great at the Preakness. Uh, give me Epicenter. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I don't really have horses because they have far too short of a, a career for me to officially adopt them. But I did have Epicenter <laughs> placing in locks of the week, so I like Epicenter. But I did too, by I'm going to have fun with this one. I'm going to go with uh, a fun name. I'm going to go with that plus 1800 Skippy Longstocking is the Ooh. great name for a horse. So give me skip, Skippy skip, Long. Skip. Let's see. That's uh, one, two, three, four, five, 
Uh, okay, the seventh favorite out of nine horses running, but I'm going to go with it. Skippy Longstocking. There's only nine run the at the Preakness? Um, well, there's nine listed on Bovada. It could be more than that. Yeah, but there's got to be more. Bovada. I'm not sure because Kentucky Derby had like for sure more than 15. Um, it might actually only be nine because I'm looking at CBS as well and it only has nine posted. Um, I'll, okay, I'll check well, out how many horses are racing. Good to know. Well, okay. Looking forward to it. Definitely going to tune in for a few minutes. It's definitely worth the watch. Not quite the spectacle of the Kentucky Derby, uh, but for a few minutes, definitely something I'm looking forward to. Huge Saturday of sports, by the way, Tom. Uh, we mm. have, I'm not, you know, I'm going to make you work hard enough next week for men's Champions League soccer. <laughs> we also have the women's Champions League soccer final. Oh, no. uh, it is Barcelona is a heavy favorite going to repeat as champion. I, I know a few weeks ago, I told you they had no losses. They finally got one loss. It was in the second leg of their Champions League semi, but they'd already won big in the first leg that it didn't even matter. Uh, so women's Champions League soccer at noon on Saturday. Then we have PSG and my boy Messi, the GOAT, coming off two goals in the last game at 2 o'clock. Uh, then we've got the Preakness, I think is what, roughly – like around six-ish. And then we have NBA playoffs that night, NHL playoffs. Good thing I'm off work on Saturday. It's going to be a busy, <laughs> busy day. Definitely going to try to get some outdoor time as well in this beautiful weather. Uh, by Absolutely. the way, Messi, rumors are that he's going to enter Miami uh, in uh, the, um, after his contract expires at PSG this next season. Who knows if it's true? But if it is true, I'm going to take you to a soccer game, Chicago Fire, my treat, <laughs> and you can watch Messi play. The, uh, the the second greatest of all time after Cristiano Ronaldo. Check no really way! quickly on the Preakness Ooh. Finals. Uh, a maximum of 14 horses race. It looks like there's 10, but that might be down to nine because this article was posted a little bit earlier uh, yesterday. Okay. Um, so it's it's going to be a, a smaller field than it typically is uh, from what I'm seeing being reported. Um, moving into the locks of the week, I know we already touched on a couple of them throughout the show, but come and give us the recap. Yeah, we had a two-week hiatus, so these might sound like old picks. They are old. Uh, we obviously do a weekly show. We didn't get a chance to do one last week. With both Roughly, of our yeah. work schedules. <laughs> uh, but pretty big week for Drew Brackett. Uh, he was 3-0. and He actually had an 0-3 week the week before. Flipped it to 3-0. and uh, He had the Hurricanes minus 120 over the Boston Bruins in game two of that series. Seems like a million years ago. But he was right. Hurricanes winning 5-2. Uh, he had the Tampa Bay Lightning over the Maple Leafs. Minus 105 in game two. Tampa winning 5-3. Uh, EPL, Christus, Crystal Palace, Watford under two and a half. He was correct. Crystal Palace winning 1-0, one, one total goal. So Drew was very hot with EPL over under. He had cooled off lately, but got back on the right track. I didn't do as well. One and two. I had Warriors, Grizzlies over 227.5 points. 106-101, uh, Grizzlies winning uh, in that game too. 207, missed that one. I did get uh, the, let's see, what did I get? Heat minus, minus eight. eight over the Sixers. What was that final? Uh, at this In point, game I don't two. remember. Uh, oh, it, was, it was a pretty big number. I've got yeah. it, 119, 103. I, for some reason, I thought it said 109, and I'm like, that didn't cover, but it's 119. They won by 16, only had to win by nine. Thank you very much, Miami. And then I actually tried to do something that, I probably should never do. I, sh I tried to go the opposite of Drew Brackett, which I'm going to do again this week, by the way. So oh, keep that oh. in mind, Tom. But I had the Leafs over the Lightning in that game. Missed that one. Uh, you were 2-1. and one. You had up Epicenter at plus 110, finishing top three in the Derby. Got second place. Uh, you had the White Sox minus 1.5 over the Cubs. Sox winning 3-1. to one. And then here was the most interesting one. At plus 110 in the Wells Fargo Golf Tournament, you had Rory McIlroy to finish ahead of Cameron Young and Gary Woodland. Rory finished in fifth, but Cameron Young finished tied for second. BBQ City. Mm -hmm. So I will say this. I said it when you made this pick last week, and I'll say it again. 
and I hope you don't have these PGA picks this year, this week. Uh, you've been doing great at locks of the week, but I would just stay away from anything that involves like a parlay ish PGA bet. Cause that is not your go-to. Let me Absolutely get to. Absolutely not. <laughs> no, it's not. I'll get to Drew's picks real quickly. Then I'll let you pick and then I'll round it out. Uh, so Drew not with the show today. He did send in his locks. Uh, he's got the Warriors minus four and a half over the Mavericks in game one. Uh, that is Wednesday, May 18th. We're recording on Tuesday night. He's got the Oilers plus 125 on the money line over the Flames. Uh, so plus money for Drew. And then EPL soccer, of course, he's going back to his over under well. He's got uh, Aston Villa and Burnley under two and a half goals. I'll let you get rocking and rolling with your locks. I got to make sure that my Heat Celtics numbers didn't change too much uh, with uh, this uh, injury announcement. Absolutely. Go ahead, though, Tom. So for my locks of the week, I'm going to continue dabbling around and messing around with my, uh, with my plus money giveaways. So here's where we're going to go. All three are going to be in the MLB on May 18th, as I'm trying to stay away from same night uh, picks, give me the Angels. Shohei Otani on the mound against Dane Dunning. Minus one and a half runs over the Rangers. You can get that at plus 115 on Bovada. Max Scherzer goes to the mound for the New York Mets. So I'll take the Mets. Minus one and a half runs over the Cardinals at plus 105. It's barely plus money, but still counts. And then Pablo Lopez and the Marlins, minus one and a half runs over the Nationals at plus 135. Lopez is an ERA that's a, right around two, maybe a touch below. Uh, so give me the Marlins over the Nationals uh, by two runs or more in that one. So we'll see how that goes. Most baseball games aren't uh, won or lost by just one run. So go ahead and take a little extra uh, money on the odds as opposed to paying juice for a straight up winner on that. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, looks like my pick didn't change. Uh, by the way, bet baseball. I'm going to start betting baseball here in, the, in a few weeks. I think we're getting to that point where yeah, it's the only thing left, uh, where it's the only thing left, but also where stats can actually matter. So looking forward to see how you do with baseball, Tom. I think this is your first foray into the baseball world for the betting box um, this year. I had socks over Cubs for the cross. Oh, that's right. Classes, last but week. beyond that. Yeah. Okay. So. I'm struggling to find this over total on, uh, let's see, uh, on Jason Tatum because it looks like the game over under didn't change, uh, but I'm working mm. on getting uh, the player totals. Here we go, player props. Uh, so okay, uh, it it didn't change actually on the bet MGM. Twenty seven and a half. Twenty seven and a half. Actually, the odds went to minus one hundred five instead of plus one hundred. But mm. pretty pretty similar. So I had it at plus 100. It is now minus 105. Maybe the odds just shifting slightly with a couple players out for Boston, maybe expecting a little bit more points for him. But I would not expect a lot of Jason Tatum points tonight. Uh, he is averaging uh, only 17.7 points per game against the Heat this year, shooting 42% from the floor, 29% on threes. In fact, Jason Tatum in 21 games against the Heat in his career has scored 28 or more just five times, under 20 in eight of them. Uh, so definitely keep that in mind. I think 28 points is a lot to score in a game with such a great defensive team. He's just coming off a of game seven. Miami was sitting there watching game seven live game planning for Jason Tatum. I don't see him getting uh, 28 points in game one in Miami. If anything, you might jack up a couple more shots without Horford and Smart, but it actually makes it even easier to guard him without those two guys. Mm -hmm. So give me the under on Jason Tatum, 27 and a half points. And I'm going to take the under in the game. I know uh, this is something that we talked about earlier in the show. I hate doing unders. I really hate it. I'm an over better typically. I only do unders when I feel very confident. Uh, take it for what it's worth. I do feel pretty confident in this game. Under 203.5 points. The Celtics, as you mentioned, uh, Horford and Smart won't be going in game one. So 
They're down a couple of players in that game. Mm -hmm. Uh, And also, look at these statistics in the playoffs. The Heat are allowing just 97.5 points per game. Uh, That is the best in the playoffs in the league. Celtics allowing 101.8. That's the third best, but that's despite playing Durant and Giannis. Take that into account. You go up against those two guys, and you you allow just 102 points per game. Pretty impressive. So what does that average out to? 99.65 points per game on average these two teams are allowing. So if you go by that average... We should be under 200, so the 203.5 makes me feel good. I know those offenses average a little bit more than that, but it's not necessarily great offensive teams. They're obviously good, but neither was top 10 in points this season in the regular season. Uh, So amazing defenses, solid offenses, leads to not so many points. Give me the under. I'm almost tempted to switch my pick here and go with this heat minus four and a half line now that Boston have injuries, but mm-hmm. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Uh, and I, and I, since you guys might be watching this uh, after the show records, but my betting advice for you guys, take a look at Jason Tatum's under, and he's going to hit it more often than not in this series. So if you want to bet Tatum's under every single game, You will lose at some point, but you will hit in the long run. If you want to bet the unders in that series every single game, look out for that. So if you are watching this after the game aired, you'll see if I'm right or wrong. But going forward in this series, look at a lot of the unders because I'm expecting a lot of defense in this series. Uh, Then this is the one where I'm going to go against Drew. We're going to get adventurous here. And I'm going to go against the Warriors, something I don't often do. I'm a Warriors fan. I've got the Warriors winning the whole thing. But I think the Mavericks are just absolutely on a roll. I think as this series gets deeper, Warriors will uh, find ways to win. I think the Warriors actually are going to win game one. But four and a half points, I know it's not a lot. uh, But to me, just with how good the Mavericks are playing, just a little gut feeling that this goes down to uh, the last minute of the game. Uh, So with the four and a half points, uh, I like the Mavs covering against the Warriors. All right. Plenty of great uh, sporting action, sports betting action to keep an eye on for this week. We're going to be looking forward to the recap next week. Uh, Unfortunately, we can't all uh, go nine and oh as a collective as you guys are going head to head. But, um, you know. Well, we'll see. Eight and one wouldn't be too bad as a show either, which would uh, tie in nicely to a salute I'm going to have for us as a show next week. So a little bit of a preview there on to salutes and statements for this week. I'll get the ball rolling with a salute to somebody who really doesn't need it, but Tom Brady signing a 10 year, $375 million contract to be the lead color analyst for Fox sports on Sundays or Thursdays or whenever Fox sports is going to be, um on uh the nfl so basically the way this contract is structured is it's there for him to take as soon as he retires which could be after this upcoming season it could be tomorrow if he wanted it to be and just get right in the booth and take that broadcast money um but tom brady the uh the classic epitome of the phrase the rich get richer now this isn't all strictly tied into sports broadcast. I think there's some clauses in there about him working on, you know, like some, you know, as a, a personality, a front man for different account managers. So, hey, go golfing with, say, Budweiser to kind of like help secure an oh, account. Yeah. This poor, is the sort of poor thing. Poor guy. Poor guy. Yeah. So much work. Like, like the, I, and I think it was interesting that it was, it wasn't like the Fox Sports branch of the overall Fox conglomerate that announced this contract. I think it was one of the Murdochs. Um, announced it. So I wonder if there's some other, um, you know, some other things in play for Fox where Tom Brady is going to be utilized as an asset to the company. That's the only way I can really kind of justify in my head why Fox would pay him $375 million, you know, $37.5 million per year. I think the previous record was Tony Romo at like 18 something 
Uh, Roughly double. Roughly and, double, and, give or and take. Tony Romo didn't even win a Super Bowl ring, let alone seven of them, and possibly counting. Um, so, Probably. yeah, a salute to Tom Brady uh, getting more and more money for a job where he's only going to have to really work, including travel, like 90 to 100 days in a year. Um, and this kind of like ties into like a bit of a statement or a question, perhaps. Like, How much does a broadcast team affect you common wanting to watch a sporting event like do you really are you really going to turn tune into a football game because tom brady or because tony romo or chris collinsworth is on is on the color call for the game or is it just you're tuning in for the game and those guys just happen to be the ones calling it it's better if someone i like is doing it Mm -hmm. but i'll say this for the most part all of the network guys, I know some people will hate on Joe Buck, whatever. There's always that guy mm. that someone wants to hate on. But for the most part, and there's some that are better than others, but they all do a good job. They all do a good job. Uh, I care a lot more about the game now. I'll tell you this. Ray Hudson, my favorite soccer sports commentator, who uh, mostly retired. I think he's still doing some work, mm. but not for being sports anymore where I, I watched them the last, you know, five, 10 years. Uh, Ray Hudson's a guy that I can tune into just because he's got the funny phrases. I can tune into inside the NBA post game for Shaq and Charles Barkley because mm-hmm. those two guys are unbelievable. I've uh, gone fishing, Shaq and a fool. Got my girlfriend into those segments now. I consider that a massive win. Uh, but overall, with the exception of some of the all-time greats, that I mentioned in my book, Ray Hudson, Mm -hmm. uh, Chuck and Shaq. I care a lot more about the product. Uh, I think think it is interesting to see, because if you look at Tom Brady, this is part of the reason why he does have seven rings. Obviously, he's made a boatload of money over his career, and rightfully so. Uh, But he actually has made less money than a lot of the other top five quarterbacks in the game. If you look at the way his contracts have been structured, he actually has taken a little bit less money than he could have. Not saying that he didn't get paid a ton. He did. But relative to some of the other biggest names, he actually has taken like a slight pay cut for his pedigree to help the team win. Now he's like, well, as, as I'm done playing football, forget the pay cuts. Give me the money now. He's cashing in now. I'd have to look this up. Uh, but I'm pretty confident that on an average per year basis, uh, over 10 years, I guess he's played like what more than 20 now, but his average over that time cannot be 37 and a half million. How often does an athlete actually make more in the booth than they did as a player? That is in itself is mind boggling. And think about this, Tom. Okay, you mentioned some travel. I don't know where you got the stats. I don't know about 90 days. It feels like it's even less than that. Could be 90, but yeah, it was, it's like there's 21. Or there's now 20 weeks in a season. Okay. And if you figure like, he like as far as work, it's like you have like one day with each team. Okay. In addition to the actual broadcast. So it's like three days if you throw in the travel. That's like four days of like work in terms of like flying around. So like that right there. Only during right around in like, season. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. He, and by work, by the way, you know this, Tom, like, mm-hmm. like, It's fun. That stuff is fun. I'm not saying he doesn't spend some time preparing for broadcasts, but he is not working ever a full-time day, even if you count the travel. He's in 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 retrospect, like for on-air stuff, I know he'll do some traveling, but I guarantee you Tom Brady travels anyway. Mm -hmm. He's gonna be essentially getting paid 37 and a half million dollars for three hours of serious work where he's the color guy, not even the play-by-play guy. I mean, he'll do some preparation because he's a professional. Absolutely. But you know this with the broadcasting background uh, that we have, the play-by-play guy is the one that actually is doing more work. Like, they're looking for Brady to provide the analysis and just a mind-boggling amount of money. I know this was like a story that's a couple of weeks old now. That's why we didn't have it in the rundown but definitely one that we can't ignore. I'll say this, good for Tom Brady. 
I feel like Fox could have got him for a little bit less, but maybe not. Maybe that was his price. Uh, I mean, and I consider everything else that he has, like all the career, like he's earned more than 300 million. I'm pretty sure in his NFL career, plus all of his endorsements, plus like the, the money that his too. wife brings in. I think she's sure. wealthier than he is. So it, it may very well had to have been where Fox is like, well, if we want, we got to pull you away from all the rest of these things yep. going on in your life. Yep. So that's what it's worth as opposed to paying it's him more possible. than a particular broadcaster. But, yeah. but that, I think that's the beauty of Tom Brady, though. I think he realized uh, in those whatever several weeks he was retired, which, by the way, <laughs> I called BS on that from the second it happened. And you know that. You can back me. I told you he was coming back. Yep. Uh, I think he... I think he loves the game and he wants to be around it. And this is his way of, of having a plan. Cause I think like, I think his wife sort of pressured him. And again, I could be completely wrong, uh, mm. but my gut feeling is that she kind of wanted him uh, away from football and like in his, the back of his head, he also wanted some family time with, you know, his family. Uh, so, but I think he found that he was missing the game too much and he needs that void of football He's obviously not going to play forever because he is a human being, even though sometimes it doesn't feel like it uh, at his age. So I think this was his way of like, hey, I can still do football, yet be with my family, kind of find a middle ground. But good for him. Good for Brady. Definitely. Uh, by the way, we did forget sports trivia. Uh, I will have I a skipped statement. over that in the rundown. Okay. Yes, do you, you want did. to hit that really quickly or do you want to just – no, we can hit it. I don't have a great question, but I, okay. I do think it's a staple. I don't know if you've got a sports trivia this week. I've got two. They're both kind of tough because it's baseball. Oh, I love baseball trivia. <laughs> Actually, I, I, baseball is the best sport for stats and trivia. Like mm. these days, I'm a little bit more into watching basketball and football, like from a viewing perspective, but from a trivia perspective, baseball might be my favorite. So hit me, hit me with at least one and we'll see All how right. I do. I'll, I'll go for the easier one. Okay. Which still might be difficult. Okay. I'm so ready. Over the weekend, Hunter Green and Art Warren of the Cincinnati Reds combined for a no hitter and, and lost. lost one, yep. nothing to the Pittsburgh Pirates. Can you name the last time a team had a no hitter and lost? So I'm looking for the isn't year it, and the team. Yeah. Isn't it like when Randy Johnson pitched? Nope. Not Randy Johnson? Not Randy Johnson, no. Okay. Huh. All right. I guess I'll ask for clues because that is definitely a very, very hard yeah. question. I remember, so, I, think, I think Randy Johnson might have set the strikeout record and lost or something because they went to extra innings and he didn't lose. I think the team lost. I might be wrong on that. Maybe look that up in the side, mm -hmm. but I think that's why I'm, I'm fixated on Randy Johnson with this answer. Um, so as far as clues... Hmm. So the team we talked about in our show today, so that narrows it down a good bit. Okay. And the year we were, I'll narrow it to we were teenagers. Okay, so it's got to be the Yankees. No, and it's not the Yankees. Not the Yankees? We talked nope. about the Yankees. We did. We, we touched on some other teams, though. The Mets? Not the Mets. We were teenagers. We talked about the Angels. It was the Angels. Okay. And all right, all right, all right. Let me let me let me reason this out. The Angels, mm -hmm. we were teenagers, no hitter, and they lost. It was it was it, I'll give you a hint as far as like this will help with the year a little bit. The pitcher who threw the no hitter, the starting pitcher, was really good. At, at like for for his time in his like he had a pretty decent peak jared weaver do you remember yep. him yeah was it jared weaver it was jared weaver yes sir yeah nice so that must have been like 2000 and maybe like 07 close it's 08 okay. so that that's pretty that's the last time uh that that happened where a team th or uh, it throws a no-hitter and still loses the game, which is absolutely brutal. The and other the one... Red, the Reds have the worst record in the league. That was pretty quick. Hit me with the other one. Yeah. This is too much Okay, fun. so the other one, this is going to be like really, really tough because like I didn't know half of the answer to this. So okay. this is more just like for edification than anything else. Oh, come the on, I got weekend, this. 
Adam Wainwright and Yadier Molina set the record for the most pitcher catcher wins okay. in baseball history uh, with 203, which is incredible. Like, that's probably not going to get broken. No. With like the way that like pitchers the don't. Bullpens. Yeah, and, and catchers don't stick around nearly that long. And um, the DH can, and everything. Exactly. Can you name the two guys, the, the previous pitcher catcher duo? Uh, that they passed that had well, 202. My first guess is Cy Young. I don't know his catcher, but Cy Young had like 500 something wins, right? So it's got to be Cy Young and somebody. Not Cy Young, no. Okay. So... This is why I say it's going to be difficult. Like I have to go to the baseball reference to look up. Okay. Um, okay. So like I'll so start like listing. You're telling up some me clues. it's, so, uh, it's, a, it's an Famer. old school, old school pitcher and an old school catcher, right? Yeah, if you name the pitcher, because I don't think the hitter was especially good. I got to look up him as well. Okay. But if you give me the pitcher, um, let's see. So, yeah, old, old-timey old pitcher, way before we were born, perhaps. Sandy uh, Koufax. Not Sandy Koufax. Perhaps even before our parents were born. This is oh, how boy. far back we're going. Oh, boy. Gibson. Not Gibson. Um. Uh, didn't like had his rookie season and then missed the next three years because of a little something known as world war II. Oh boy <laughs> yeah, my, obviously in my head the first thing that popped up was ted williams but it was a hitter obviously right so not the answer oh my goodness this is a tough one so this is so this is in like the 40s like 40s and 50s and 40s, Maybe he 50s. pitched into the 60s. So first season was 1942, then was in the military for three years, and then pitches from 1946 until 1965 when he retired at the age of 44. Wow. Oh, gosh. Is it an Orioles guy? Um, I'm bl- I did think he play... No, never played for the Orioles. Hmm. Played for the then Boston Braves, the New York Mets. Well, played for the Braves most of his career. And then the last couple of years, it was Mets and Giants. But that was like the very tail end, just hanging on. I'm like completely blanking. I should know this. I mean, does he have 300 career wins? He has 363 career wins. Holy cow. Well, let me see if I like I can pull up like the most similar. I can just like give it because like I would not have been able to guess this as name. You'll probably you, recognize as you it. See, as soon as you say it, I'll know it. Go ahead. So the pitcher is Warren Spann. Yes. Yep, and yep. the catcher Warren is Spann. is Del Crandall. Yeah, I would not have known the catcher, but I definitely no. recognize the pitcher. Yeah, no. The, and the I work for a sports memorabilia company, and I feel like we had Warren Spann, and that's why I felt like I was going to know mm. it. Because I remember uh, doing like statistical research, and I give myself notes, and I think like that was the guy that I had like three hundred sixty something wins, and I was blanking on the name. Yeah. So that's a good one. Yeah. No. That. Yeah. And that's just like that's more for like I said edification because that's an incredible statistic. But now Adam Wainwright and Yadier Molina probably forever will be the most winning pitcher-catcher duo in baseball history. Edification? Fill me in on this one. Edification, I, I'm going to look up. The way I'm using it is like for general knowledge. And that's, I, I got that just by the context. Right. But I've never, I've never heard that before. Um, edification. Oh, this is going to sound way snootier than I mean it. Edification, okay. the definition is the instruction or improvement of a person morally or intellectually. <laughs> there you go. I'm improved. So it is, it is the obvious way of saying Thank you. your information. Thank you for improving <laughs> me as a human being, Tom. I appreciate your improvements that you're making of me. Oh, man. So. They're just like really quickly. It, there's a little chart that lists kind of like over time how a word is used. Uh, its peak seemed to be around the 1800s, 1850s. It would be. It and would then be. it tails off to very <laughs> little usage in the 1900s, in the, and 18th, now, in the, now it's the 21st century. Just on Salute Your Sports and like three other places. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to goose that number as best I can. <laughs> you have probably used that word as much today as everywhere else in the world 
at least during this hour for sure. Yeah. Edification. All right. The more you know. Glad to provide that. Awesome. I love the Castleman vocab. Uh, all right. So I do have a trivia question. This also sort of leads into my statement, but it's just something that do you ever have like those moments that in sports surprise us this way many times for the better? I would argue this wasn't for the better. Uh, mm -hmm. that that blowout that we had. I mean, the fact that the Mavs won was, you know, fine and, and dandy doesn't bother me, but they won 132 to 90. They won by or 133 to 90, excuse me. They won by uh 33 points. It was tied for the fourth biggest game seven playoff win. Obviously, game seven, if you get the seven, you figure the teams are pretty evenly matched, right? Like they should be. And what's crazy about it is they were the road team as well and the underdog in the game uh, and the series. So my trivia question, and by the way, they were up 30 at the half. They were up more than 40, 50 at one point. Like uh, that 33 points was oddly closer than the game actually was. Doesn't that sound crazy that the game was actually mm -hmm. uh, not as close rather. I said that the opposite way. Yeah, It was the 33 points made it seem closer than it was. What is the biggest playoff game seven win ever? The margin, the teams, uh, the ear, mm. biggest playoff game seven margin. I'll start off by giving you the same clue you gave me for your first baseball trivia question. We would have been teenagers. Okay. So that kind of leads me to where I, I'm thinking it's like, like that Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett, Ray Allen, Boston team. So I believe, Tom, the one you're referencing, mm -hmm. I got to pull the article back. I want to say uh, that is, I, I believe that one is tied for the fourth biggest with this one. So that is a great guess. Mm. Okay. Not the biggest one. Not the biggest one. I have this on my phone here. Let me pull it back up. Game seven, biggest margin of victory. Uh, that actually was the third biggest. So this one is a tie for the mm. fourth biggest at 33. The Celtics Hawks was 94, 65, 34 points. There was two games higher than that one. One was the 1948 semifinals, Philadelphia Warriors over the St. Louis Bombers, uh, 85, 46, 39 points. And there was oh. one more uh, that was bigger yeah, I feel like that was like some. It was like a forty-four point margin of victory. Saying sounds like the right number, but who who would have played in that one? Like who would have been slightly less? It's forty points. I'll give you that. Forty points. It was. You mentioned this player earlier in the show. They might be giving it away. Oh, I mentioned a couple of players. Was and it? Was it Dirk Nowitzki's Mavericks? Yes. But who did they beat? This so, was a sort of like early yeah. super team duo type thing. A team that... Oh, was it over the Lakers? Kobe and Shaq? Not the Lakers. Mm. This was a team that I would say they greatly oh, underachieved. Oh, that was probably then the, the Houston Rockets. Yes, sir. I'm not going to, yeah, the, the Yao Ming, Tracy McGrady, Houston Rockets. So that was probably, like, that was like 06, 07, something like that. Pretty close. 05. Pretty close. Okay. 116 <sighs> to points. 76, 40 points. And actually, wow. uh, Yao and Tracy combined for 60 points in that game. The rest of their team had 16. <laughs> it wasn't their fault. The Mavericks That is an held, awkward locker room yes, after the, the game. Yes, the rest of the Rockets to 16 points good lord crazy and like that dallas mavericks team just kind of flamed out after that right or no oh five is when they won it all no it's not uh they won in oh no that was that was like later against the heat yes no I like that was, was well yeah but I, they didn't win a playoff series after that championship yeah. until luca just won one these playoffs by the way, Jason Kidd, who's now the Mavericks coach, was on uh, that was, team. Was the point guard uh, on on that Dallas Mavericks team, and that that beat the Heat in the finals. So, I thought oh, it was kind of timely, and it was like yeah. a Dallas related one. 
Yeah, no, was, that all ties in uh, very, very nicely then. Yeah, I was a little rushed. I was looking through stuff, and I was like, man, that was one of the craziest games I've ever seen. <laughs> I looked it up. I'm like, what other game was there a bigger blowout? So uh, anything else you have in, in terms of salute statements? I know you hit on uh, the break. Yeah, no, I hit on the broadcast. And yeah, and I just skipped over trivia because I, I, didn't, I took down the rundown, and I just kind of glanced over that in my notes as well. So You're good. Uh, yeah, my statements. Set. My it. statement of the week is I don't even have anything written down. Normally I drop mm-hmm. myself some, some stats, but it, it transitions into what we just saw. Uh, I will tell you that this game seven performance by the Phoenix Suns, I will go on the limb and say this, Tom, the most embarrassing performance in NBA playoff history. It's never been more embarrassing. You had the best record in the league. You were at home. You'd won every home game in that series. You had the better team on paper. You had the second and third best players in this series on paper. I get it. Luka Doncic is generational. I get it. The Mavs are playing great. How in the world are you down 30 points at the half? You've got yourselves supposedly one of the best leaders in the game in Chris Paul. You've got the NBA coach of the year in Monty Williams. You've got young Kobe mentality, Devin Booker. How does this happen? I mean, this is just unbelievable, Tom. I was at work uh, hosting uh, my sports memorabilia show, and I someone in our chat said the score. And I was like, no, that can't be right. Mm-hmm. They're messing with me. That cannot be right. That cannot be right. That is just an embarrassing score. It is the most embarrassing score of all time, quite frankly. I don't think there's been ever a more embarrassing result. Uh, you're the favorite. You're on your home court. You're coming off an NBA championship appearance. I, I just don't get how this happens. Like, how does it happen? And and I'm going to do something that maybe you didn't expect me to do. I'm going to call out Chris Paul. Wow. Uh, Chris Paul, uh, this one is in part on him. Chris Paul is a guy that is supposed to be one of the smartest basketball players. Uh, you know, we know him as a pass first point guard. How was he not shooting the ball? Chris Paul had eight field goal attempts in that game. He finished four of eight. I know he was cold in the first half. Most of those were going in the second half. How do you get eight field goal attempts? You notice how cold the rest of your teammates are? CP3, what are you doing? What are you doing? It's just shocking. Absolutely shocking to see such a porous performance uh, from the Suns. Just unbelievable how you get down that much. They had 17 points in the first quarter. 10 in the second quarter. They had 27 points at halftime. Their team that gets like 27 in the first quarter. More than that, usually. I just, I know it's a make or miss league. You've got off games, but that's, this cannot happen. You cannot be down 30 points at home in a game seven game on your home court when you're favored, you've got the better team. It just, Most embarrassing loss I've I've ever seen uh, in NBA playoff history. Uh, And that's one that's going to sting. And it's one that's going to, quite frankly, really hurt Chris Paul's legacy. Uh, He's been on several teams that blew 3-1 leads, 3-2 leads. Uh, He's known as a great leader. But clearly, he didn't inspire his teammates. And I think that's going to be the knock on him. Uh, You know, you look at his playoff numbers, they're pretty good. He's had some great playoff games, uh, but he's also a guy that sometimes has to realize that he's got to shoot the ball because he's a very good shooter. And we saw this at times in last year's NBA finals. Part of it was, yes, he was tired, uh, but he didn't shoot the ball enough last year. He didn't shoot the ball enough in this game uh, and just horrible for Paul, horrible from Booker. Horrible from DeAndre Ayton. These guys got to do better. Uh, My statement is that it's the most embarrassing loss in playoff history. I can't remember one. Can you remember one 
that was more embarrassing because that Celtics one that you mentioned, mm -hmm. I think it was like Celtics were a one seed. Atlanta was an eight seed. The Mavericks, I believe, were probably the higher seed in that Rockets game. I, I can probably, definitely confirm yeah. that, but not 100% 100 sure on it. But this was uh, the one seed in the West against uh, what were the Mavs? A four seed, a five seed, four seed? Four seed. One versus four seed. Yeah. Just, and then the I, team that had the best record in the NBA that's coming off of you know, being Western Conference champs, you know, not really changing the roster all that much from one season to another. Yeah. So if anything, they all should have been better as a collective. And then you throw in the national embarrassment of, you know, Patrick Beverly on one of the ESPN, you know, morning talk shows, you know, how, he's, how he was talking to, to Paul George saying, man, I wish we faced these guys. Like we would have destroyed them. And I'm sure like that's partly, you know, Pat Bev have. being partly Bev. Pat Bev. Um, but but that's definitely, you know, you go and you perform like that, or rather you don't perform, and then you've got your own peers clowning you. You know, like that's that's bad. That's, bad. that's very bad. I had ESPN.com pulled up. I don't know if you heard that ad playing, but mm. it is no, I didn't hear that. Yeah, definitely embarrassing for uh for the Suns, but yeah, I think that's going to do it for the show, Tom. Uh, unless there's anything else you want to add? No, I've got everything covered on my end. Sweet. Rock solid show. We'll be back next week. We'll see just how we're doing with these NBA playoff picks. Uh, I think we're on the same page again. That is worth Dangerous for combination. Yeah, dangerous combination. Uh, we definitely have done well with our Warriors picks. Uh, but otherwise, I don't know. We'll see. Dangerous combination could make us look really smart or really dumb, uh, but hoping for the Warriors to make us look good. Uh, we'll definitely delve more into uh, how the NBA playoffs are looking. That'll be the big talking point uh, next week. Looking forward to it, Tom. Thank you very much uh, for co-hosting with me. Of course. And thank Pleasure's you always. To, to all the viewers uh, that watch our show. You guys are awesome. We'll see you next week.